You probably want sound if you're trying to hear me online. That looks good now. Um, today is the due date of cannabis? No. The one before cannabis, maybe? I don't know. There's three of them that are live right now. I think there's a due date today, a due date Thursday, and a due date next Tuesday already that I've already posted. I posted the due date for the polymers one, I think, for next Tuesday, um, because my expectation is, is that that will be finished today. And we're gonna hopefully start a new unit today or possibly Thursday, which is pesticides. And we're kind of running out of time. So, you know, I, I don't have any huge agenda here. I just figure we'll go as long as we can go. Um, yeah, I think we're good. That said, let us continue. So we've been talking about plastics. We've been talking about polymers, naturally occurring polymers. We looked at a couple of variations. We also talked about um, uh, artificial ones, you know, ones that we have invented. And we finished off talking about nylon. And this was 1939, I think, this, they first went on sale. And we talked about some of the cultural and societal impacts that resulted from that. And, you know, it didn't stop with nylon. All kinds of plastics are produced today. Um, various kinds, various uh, types, and really it's hard to imagine our world today without plastics. And anything that is as transformative as something like the development of plastic is, um, it comes with good and bad, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today. So this is a picture, uh, this is actually part of an art installation. And what you can see are, these are all little bits of um, plastic that were retrieved from the ocean. And this is a zoom in, and you can see, if you zoom in here, some features, for example, that looks like maybe like a comb with some of the little teeth pulled off. Uh, various random other little bits of plastic here. And if you zoom out here, you can see what was actually done. That was like a bottle cap. And you can see this. It's a copy of a very famous painting. Uh, this is composed of 2.4 million pieces of plastic that were retrieved from the Pacific Ocean. That number, 2.4 million, is equal to the number of pounds of plastic that enters the oceans every hour. To give an idea worldwide how much plastic we are generating and that ends up in the oceans. Now, a lot of this, a lot of this garbage is coming from um, Asian countries. A, a small percent comes from Europe, a small percent comes from North America, but certainly there are some countries that have, are producing and, and dumping way more plastic into the oceans uh, than we do around here. And for that reason, much of it ends up in the Pacific. I'd say there's probably a lot more plastic in the Pacific than there is in the Atlantic. And what happens is due to prevailing ocean currents, the plastic that ends up in the Pacific Ocean ends up sort of getting caught in these giant spirals. And it kind of concentrates the plastic garbage in these two spots. And you can see this one is called the Eastern Garbage Patch, and the other one's the Western Garbage Patch. It's estimated to contain about 5.1 kilograms of plastic per square kilometer of this area, which is six times the amount of zooplankton that's in that same area. So like very, very significant amount. It's called the Eastern Pacific Garbage Patch often. Now this plastic can be anywhere from like, you know, a bottle, a plastic bag, you know, big chunks of plastic that you can see with your eyes, all the way down to like microscopic little bits of plastic that we often call microplastics. We're gonna talk a little bit about both of these as we go forward. One of the main issues about having plastic in the oceans, if it's larger pieces, is that wildlife will often mistake plastic as possible food, and they'll eat it. Uh, this is a picture of an albatross that um, was found dead, and as the body kind of rotted away, you can see the contents of the stomach was just filled with bits of plastic that this had consumed. 
This is just a neat little infographic that shows different types of plastic that do end up in the ocean, how long it lasts in the ocean before it ultimately breaks down. So you know, these are sort of uh, plastic holders that you often see a six pack of cans pulled together with. It'll last about 400 years for breaking down, um, 450 years for plastic bottle. All these various things, you know, take different amounts of time. And it's actually interesting, if you look back 100 years ago, essentially 100% of household waste of garbage was, would break down rapidly. And what people would do, often in Nova Scotia, where many people live close to the shore, is the way they'd get rid of their garbage before garbage trucks would come collect it, is they would load it onto a boat, and they'd go out half a kilometer or something like that into the water, and then just dump it all overboard and then come back. But really, that was okay. Because what did people actually dump? Food scraps, maybe, that's gonna be gone <laughs> within the day, probably. Um, metal for cans and things like that would rust out, probably like in a week or two, in the ocean. There was no plastic that was gonna persist. Uh, paper, that would decompose very quickly. And then the only other thing that might last a while would be things like ceramic or glass, which would sink and sit on the bottom, but would behave very much like uh, stone or rock or any other kind of inorganic material that sits at the bottom of the ocean already anyway. Um, a lot of this would, would break with the action of the waves. If it's, if it's glass, it would break up. And actually, it can wash back up on shore in the form of beach glass. So that's just broken glass that's you know, it was dropped down there and broken years and years ago. But plastics are a bit different. Plastics will float around. They're a little bit less dense. They can go rise to the surface and they can last for hundreds of years, as you can see here. And as it breaks down, it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. And ultimately you get these little tiny bits we call microplastics. So, Microplastics uh, can be large enough that you can see them with your eyes, and sometimes they're little pieces that are smaller than that. They're just very tiny pieces of plastic, and the concern with microplastics, uh, particularly right now, is that they may have the ability to cross cell membranes and enter cells, enter biological tissue, and have God knows what effects. We're just really starting to learn about the possible effects of microplastics. A report just came out last week, actually, that they found I don't know, it was like 50% of people they tested, they were able to find microplastics in their bloodstream. So it's in our bodies right now. And this is potentially a real problem associated with plastic use. Um, this is where most of the ocean microplastic comes from. It's in the ocean, of course, it ends up in microorganisms, which are eaten by macroorganisms like fish, and we eat fish, so it's not hard to see how ocean plastic could end up inside of us. Um, you can see car tires actually make up about a quarter of it as they break up into little bits of rubber and, and so on in the water. Uh, so yeah, the microplastics are consumed by wildlife and it could enter the food chain that way. Larger bits of plastic too have just a, a, a garbage problem as well. And sometimes we like to think that plastics are environmentally friendly because they are recyclable, which is too, too true to a degree. Um, however, I think that argument only really holds if we were to actually recycle a large fraction of the plastics that we do use. This is another image, same art installation. This is 2 million plastic bottles, which is the number used in the US every five minutes. Just to give you an idea of the scale of this problem, like the amount of plastic that people are actually using and, and spreading. And of that 2 million, about 10% get recycled. About 90% isn't. And so I don't know what percent ends up in the environment. A lot of it is landfilled. Uh, that, that's maybe not the best either. This is another one 
if you zoom in, it looks like this. It's 60,000 plastic bags, the number used in the US every five seconds. Um, although those are banned now here in Nova Scotia. Under most uses, you can actually, if you buy meat, you can get plastic bags. And I think there may be a few other exceptions, but generally speaking, uh, you can, these are starting to be cut back. This is another picture. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is not an art piece. This is an actual inside of a store, a dollar store, um, from when Hurricane Katrina went through southern US, um, through New Orleans. This is the aftermath of what it looked like inside one of the dollar stores. And it's not hard to see like where our plastic is coming from when you look at the contents of a store like this. Uh, essentially everything here is plastic. And, and when you think about it, everything you buy, everything you look at, if it's not plastic itself, it's probably wrapped in plastic or contains plastic. Uh, it's such a central part of the way we live right now, for good or for bad. Obviously, it has lots of advantages. You know, if you buy food that's wrapped in plastic, it keeps it um, from drying out, it keeps it from getting dirty, it keeps it clean, all these things. There's lots of real benefits of plastics, but we have to be very careful of, you know, keeping in mind all the environmental impacts that they can have. Um, this is a story of a, a Canadian high school student who won the Canada-wide Science Fair back in 2008. And um, I actually had a research student who came second that year. So she knew this guy. But anyway, he uh, isolated a microbe that lunches on plastic bags. And this is in interesting, like, can plastics biodegrade? And for a long time, the answer to that question was no. But the other thing that is true about the world and evolution is that as soon as a plant, say, develops the ability to create a new molecule, sooner or later, some microorganism also evolves to use that as a food. <laughs> and so using carbon-based molecules as a fuel source. So, you know, eventually, I think it's almost as a guarantee that microorganisms are going to develop that are going to be able to use plastic as a food source, and that may, you know, it might take a million years, so it's not something we should bank on. But sooner or later, uh, I think this is going to be possible. There are bacteria that are known that'll eat nylon. Uh, nylon actually has a structure that's close-ish to certain proteins. It has amide bonds in it, which proteins have. Um, these were discovered actually in a, like a, a tailings pond. It was outside of a factory that produced nylon and it dumped waste into this pool in the back. And they found this bacteria in there that was eating like the waste from the nylon production, which contained nylon-ish chemicals, bits of nylon, garbage, this sort of stuff. So, you know, maybe in the long term, you know, maybe in a million years, this problem will be fixed. All right, we have a few questions here as a bit of a break. Um, first question is, what is the highly flammable, partially synthetic polymer that is used to make ping pong balls? And we talked about this last class, not today. The answer is nitrocellulose. What silk substitute was invented by Wallace Carruthers in 1938, became popular material in fashion that was nylon, we talked about. So what we're going to do is talk about, you know, since nylon, what are the most important plastics that we use today? I'm going to use my dog mom mug here. I'm not a dog mom. I don't have a dog. And I'm not a mom, so. But the coffee's good. By the way, I make coffee at home. And uh, I use an espresso maker. And I have an espresso machine that, you know, you grind the beans and you put it in, the whole thing. Um, I recently, just this week, had my own home espresso tested in an analytical lab for caffeine content. And it turns out my espresso that I make at home, on a double shot, the machine will make 55 milliliters in a double shot. 
and that has 151 milligrams of caffeine, which is almost exactly the same as the amount in a small Tim Hortons coffee. And it's also, uh, so a, an extra large Tim Hortons coffee has like 270 milligrams. So yeah, my home double shot of espresso is basically a small Tim Hortons coffee. If you have a similar machine, we're <laughs> curious how much is in there. Um, why was I talking about that? I don't know. So the number one plastic that's in use today is called polyethylene. And polyethylene comes from this molecule, which is ethylene. And ethylene is found in natural gas. It's found in, it can be produced, it's actually produced by certain plants. Like bananas produce ethylene as they ripen. So I guess potentially you could collect the gases coming off of bananas and make plastic out of it. But what happens is you get these long chains where each one of these little corners is a CH2. So it's basically a big string of CH2 groups making these really, really long molecules, hundreds of thousands of C carbons long, all covered in hydrogens, and you get these really long threads. And these threads can be packed together, and uh, that material is polyethylene plastic. And this is like the common white, clear, flexible plastic that we use for all sorts of different things. In 2017, we made more than 100 million tons of this stuff. It's about a third of all plastics that are made are this type of plastic. It's used in plastic bags, pop bottles, water bottles, all sorts of different, different things. There's two main types. I say there's two main types. I'm going to correct that and say there's three main types of polyethylene. The third one is a relatively recent um, addition. There's high density polyethylene, which is HDPE, is the abbreviation for it. It has these long chains that we talked about of the polyethylene chains. They pack together, like you see in this image, where they kind of like go back and forth on each other and they pack really tightly and nicely which makes a really rigid material. And so this is good for, you know, a plastic bottle that might hold your shampoo or something like that, where it holds its shape. It's maybe a little flexible, but it's not going to bend. You know, it's, it's gonna retain that solid form. The chain itself is just a straight, long, linear chain that packs together. And that's how we make high density polyethylene. You can also make ethylene, polyethylene in a way that has all of these kind of like side branches. So it's not just straight lines anymore, it's straight lines with these branches that kind of come off, almost like the roots of a tree. And when you have these types of chains, they don't pack together really tightly, like they do if they're just normal chains. And so you end up with a material that's a lot more flexible. And we use that for typically like um, plastic that you might use in like flexible packaging, or you know something like that. We call this low density polyethylene uh, because the, the branch chains don't pack together very well. It's not as rigid. Both of these are recyclable and you can tell what type of plastic it is based on the recycle code. So if you have like a plastic bottle that's disposable and you flip it over on the bottom, typically they'll have these numbers inside the symbol that's telling you the type of plastic it is and you know, if you were to sort your garbage, you would know how to sort it based on the number. Around here though, we just dump it all in the same container. And then in the sorting stations, they would sort it out by plastic type, ideally. The third one that I referred to is one that's often used in, in, um, in manufacturing now. It's called PEX plastic. And it's, PEX is often used now as replacing copper in plumbing. So if you have a, a newish build on a house or something like that, um, all the water lines in your house are probably made out of PEX tubing and not copper tubing like what used to be used. PEX is like these long chains, you know, like high density, but they have these like ties that tie them all together. These are called cross links. And what the cross links do is make a very, very tough material. So it's really hard to separate these chains from each other because they're like physically linked to each other through these cross links that you see here on the chains. 
So this is PEX tubing, and I'm sure sometime in your life you'll come across um, PEX, which is a sort of a third type of polyethylene. And I think the PEX actually stands for PE is polyethylene, and the X means like cross-linked, cross-linked polyethylene. Number two plastic is polypropylene. Polypropylene is actually very similar in structure to polyethylene, except it uses propylene, which is actually made from propane. And propane is found in natural gas. It's what we burn in our barbecues typically at home. And if you remove a molecule of hydrogen from propane, you get pro propylene. And then you can turn that into a plastic, which has, again, a this is a carbon, this is a CH3, and a hydrogen here, this is a CH2. And then this unit repeats again and again and again in these very long chains. It looks a lot like a polyethylene chain, except every second carbon has these little like studs that come off, which are the methyl groups. The, these types of plastic, um, also very, very common, they tend to produce a material that's a little more durable than polyethylene. And this material is often used, like, if you have like a plastic chair, you know, like that kind of hard, it's a little flexible, but it's also, you know, uh, durable. Like, it's going to last for a long time. It's often used in also, like, um, in plumbing. It can be used as, I know in our building prior to renovations, all of the draining pipes in the whole building were polypropylene. It's also very chemically resistant, which is good if you're in a chemistry building. Um, so yeah, it's, it's useful for that. And it has the recycling code five. Here's a paper um, that was published in Science. Remember the journal Science we talked about? Um, this is talking about contaminants leaching from disposable laboratory plasticware. And the reason I'm bringing this particular paper up is if you look at number five, we have an Acadia chemistry connection here. Um, Dr. Amtab Jha, who's in our department, was one of the people working in this paper. And basically what they found is that plastic that was designed for use for biochemical experiments, little like culture tubes and things like that, um, what they were finding is that they contained chemicals from the manufacturing that could interfere with the exact biochemical assays that they were designed to contain. And they were able to show, in particular in this case, there are things called slip agents, which are materials that are put on the surface of the plastic to actually make um, it, it, it lubricate. So if you had, imagine you have like a little plastic container with a plastic cap, and you want to snap the cap in. To make it slide in easy, you can put slip agents on the surface of the plastic. And they were finding well, if you use these plastics with the slip agents, there are certain types of assays that it'll screw up. And they found it out the hard way because they kept getting weird results and they tried to like figure out the reason. And this paper was very much like a warning to anybody who are doing these tests, like be careful the kind of plastic you're using. But the reason I wanted to bring this particular one up, other than to you know, give a shout out for my colleague in chemistry, was, um, to show that when we're talking about the issues surrounding plastics, it's not just the plastic itself. It also contains all sorts of different additives that you could potentially have in there that could leach out. We, we saw that already with the case of bisphenol A leaking out from polycarbonate plastic. And it's, there's issues that surround these types of chemicals as well. All right, so we're going to get to that in more detail when we talk about this third most common plastic, which is polyvinyl chloride, PVC. Polyvinyl chloride starts from the molecule vinyl chloride. It's the monomer. It is then polymerized into these long chains where every second carbon has a chlorine atom on it. So it looks like polypropylene over here, except instead of CH3s every second carbon, we have chlorines every second carbon. And this gets the recycling code number three. It's often just called vinyl, and it's the third most produced plastic today, 40 million tons per year. PVC is very durable, very cheap, and it's used in all sorts of things. It's used in um, plumbing as well. 
I had this picture of a house in Wolfville that a friend of mine was looking at once, and probably it was when I was looking, uh, putting together this particular lecture, and I was just struck by how like almost everything you see in this picture is polyvinyl chloride. The siding here is all vinyl siding, which is polyvinyl chloride. Um, the shutters are typically made out of vinyl. The white railings are polyvinyl chloride here. Uh, the, probably all the piping in the house, like the drain pipes and the gutters are PVC. There's PVCs everywhere. We use it so much for building materials. It's not even fit. Now vinyl comes in very different morphologies. So this rubber duck, you can imagine, you probably maybe had one of these or still have one, where it's very flexible, it's, you could squeeze it, you could throw it as hard as you could at the floor and it just bounce up. Very kind of tough and, and durable but flexible. That's the exact same plastic, PVC, as what you would find in an album. An album, uh, like, a, like a record, is also made out of vinyl, and that's why we call it vinyl records. But those are rigid, they're brittle. If you dropped it on the, on the ground, it would probably shatter. They have very, very different properties. They also have different colors, which we'll talk about in a second too. That's because often what we do with vinyl is we add materials called plasticizers to them after or during their, their uh, production. The molecules that are most often used are a group of molecules called phthalates, and they are added to, not polystyrene, PVC, to make it softer and more pliable. And the more plasticizer you have, the softer the plastic gets. And they can be up to like 60% of the mass of PVC plastic. So if you ever have like a, the thing I'm thinking about is when you have a pen, and sometimes it has like a little rubber-ish kind of like coating where you, where you hold it, and then when they get old, they start to get really sticky. Ever experienced that? He likes the Radiohead example, good. Good, I approve. So when, when you have like a kind of plastic that's kind of rubbery lo looking, but it gets sticky when it gets old, what ha what's happening is you have PVC with phthalates or plasticizers like phthalates in it, and over time they migrate out of the plastic, and when they migrate out, you get this sticky kind of film coating it. And uh, to me at that point, is, it's, it's garbage time for those things. You can't wash it out. What the plasticizers do is normally in a rigid material, you have these long chains that pack together really nicely, which gives you a hard, rigid material, like you would see in these vinyl records. But what the plasticizer does is like interrupts, it gets in between the chains and prevents them from packing together nicely anymore. And then when that happens, you get this material that's a lot more flexible and a lot less brittle and rigid, which is, would be the case here for our friend the duck. So I remember when my kids were small, um, we'd go to the dollar store and they'd always want like some $1 toy, for example, and it'd be a little doll or something like that. And sometimes you'd open them out of the package and they're already like really sticky. In those cases, I just throw them out. It's PVC that has, God knows how it was produced or whatever, but it has, the phthalates are coming right out of it. And you can feel the stickiness. Um, Barbies, Barbie dolls, since they've been uh, first introduced in the 1960s, have been made out of PVC as well, softened with phthalates. And um, it, it turns out, I went down a rabbit hole uh, on the internet one day where this is apparently the, the model of the very first commercially available Barbie doll with that outfit and everything. And apparently it's worth a lot of money if you have one in good shape. But what happens with them is you can see she's wearing earrings and those earrings that she's wearing are made out of copper. They didn't put anything expensive on her like gold, but they're made out of copper. And what copper does over time is it oxidizes from copper to copper oxide, and copper oxide is green. 
And so most Barbies, like what people would do is they'd buy them and they'd put them in a box. Some people would put them in a drawer somewhere and like keep them good forever. And then if you pulled it back out after like 10 or 20 or 50 years, what you'd find is Barbie would have this like big green circle around her ears because um, that green oxidation from the copper would go into the plastic and because the plastic was so soft from the plasticizers, it could migrate through the plastic. You know, it would take years, but it would do that. So most of the original Barbies have this flaw. And if you have a Barbie without that flaw, apparently it's worth like a ton of money. And the way to fix it, I guess, is if you have the Barbie, you could either store it in an oxygen-free container and seal it, which is probably the, the hard way to do it, the other thing you can do is actually just take the earrings off and store them separately, and then you don't get this green patch that grows in there as well. Just in case you ever wanted to get into Barbie doll collecting. All right, my coffee's starting to get cold, so it's, it's good here. So what about these phthalates? Are they bad for us? And you know, you can find all kinds of sources saying that they're either the worst thing in the world or they're not bad at all. Uh, the truth is, is you know, phthalates are a, a broad class of chemicals. There's many different types of phthalates that have been used at different times throughout history. Um, they're not only used as plasticizers, they're used sometimes in perfumes, and they're used in maybe in shampoos and things like that as well. There's all sorts of different uses. And these are just uh, some ads that are sort of drawing attention to this fact. Definitely what's true is there are some of them that are known to be really bad. And the worst ones have been already banned for use in consumer items. Um, that, that begs the question though is, the worst one that wasn't bad enough to get banned, how bad is that? And, and the worry here with these chemicals, it's known that all of the ones that are used all the time are very low toxicity, very low lifetime, um, you know, chronic impacts and all these sorts of things. But the issue with them is, which you know, these numbers may not fully capture, is just how continuously we get exposed to these. Phthalates are literally everywhere. There's phthalates in the dust in the air of every room you're in, because phthalates are such a ubiquitous additive to chemicals, that, to plastics that are absolutely everywhere. So you could never buy a plastic item, and you're still going to be ingesting phthalates just from the world that we live in, okay? So I would say maybe like <laughs> there's not a good answer to that question. We know that like an acute dose is almost very unlikely to cause us much danger, especially these compounds actually are, are extremely rapidly broken down in our bodies. They don't persist in our bodies. They're broken down very rapidly. Um, but I think there's still some, some science to be done here when it comes to possible lifetime accumulated long-term effects. Before I get too doom and gloom about all these like possible unknown long-term health effects, just one thing I want to point out to everybody here is that like the history of humanity has been our lifetimes are just lifespans getting longer and longer and longer. So even though we might have invented some things which are, have possible negative long-term health consequences, on the whole, our inventions have extended our lives dram dramatically from how things were like 100 years ago. Why are vinyl records black? This was actually an interesting question because PVC plastic is not black. It took me a bit of digging actually to find out why. And it all goes back to this patent in 1961. Sometimes you might get like a, a, a vinyl record that is some other color, sometimes you see a bright blue one or a bright red one, like it doesn't have to be black. But the reason they're black is because what they do is when they mix the plastic together, they mix it with carbon, charcoal. We talked about charcoal a lot in the water chapter, what it's good for and what it does. They add it to these two as well, because one other aspect of charcoal or graphite is that it's a pretty good conductor of electricity. And so the reason this is done is because PVC plastic is a good insulator, doesn't let electricity through it, 
And so by adding the graphite to it, it turns it into a pretty good conductor of electricity. Because what they were finding is if you don't add it to the record, as the record plays and the needle is dragging along the surface of the record, static electricity can build up. Static electricity can attract dust to the surface of the record. And then if the needle continues playing the record with dust on the record, it can wear down the needle and it can wear down the record. So they found that records under normal playing conditions would last longer if you impregnated them with carbon prior to using them, and they've been made it, making it that way ever since. So it keeps the static charge from building up, um, which probably the dust not only wears the records, it probably also contributes to like, you know when you sometimes listen to a record and you hear like the, the hiss and the pop and the cracks every once in a while, the, those are probably little bits of dust or whatever that it's, it's, it's reading when it goes around. Cool. So one way that some places deal with their garbage is to incinerate it at very high temperatures or sometimes maybe not so high temperatures. I know some people that will burn their garbage themselves in their fireplace or in their backyard sometimes, which is probably not a great thing to do. One thing if you burn PVC is you can make a molecule called a dioxin. And dioxins are particularly nasty substances. Dioxins, um, one particular dioxin, is, which has this structure, I'll draw it out for you here. If you've taken chemistry, this might mean something to you. These are benzene rings. If you have a chlorine and a chlorine and a chlorine and a chlorine, this molecule is the most toxic chemical that's a synthetic chemical made by people. What's the most toxic natural chemical? Who remembers this one? Yeah? Not mercury, no. It's botulism toxin produced by, I don't know what the species is called, but botulism toxin is the most toxic chemical known to human beings, and this one is the number one synthetic most toxic molecule. This molecule is um, about a million times less toxic than botulism toxin, so it doesn't even hold a candle to the natural ones. But anyway, a particularly nasty thing. This was used, if you go back a little bit, the um, <laughs> Russia-Ukrainian conflict is not brand new. It's old, and uh, this was a, a former uh, president of the Ukraine, Viktor Yushchenko, and he was poisoned by uh, giving him a, a very large dose of that particular compound, this dioxin molecule with chlorines attached to it. And he developed this, this skin issue that you can see here. It's called chloracne. It's a skin issue you get if you are exposed to certain toxins that contain a lot of chlorine atoms. Um, so yeah, these are really, really nasty things. This is the, the bad one with the four chlorines on it. And it has the LD50 of one microgram per kilogram. I said a million times less toxic than Botox, uh, botulism toxin. It's only about a thousand times less, which is still a lot, but like, yeah, pretty bad. It also has chronic health effects. It's a group one carcinogen, which is, you know, not so good either. The acceptable daily intake is 0 0.7 picograms per kilogram of body weight per day. That's an extremely small number. Um, like, if you have one gram, one thousandth of that is a milligram. One thousandth of that is a microgram. One thousandth of a microgram is a nanogram and one thousandth of a nanogram is a picogram. So that's how small a dose you can handle of this compound safely every day. Now there's a factor of 100 built into that, right? We remember how you calculate ADIs? 
Clostridium botulinum is the bacteria that produces botul botulism, botulism toxin. Thank you. Uh, this is a paper actually that was written by a guy I worked with, Sierra Rain at UVic. And, um, okay, sorry if I'm distracting with my coffee, but I'm finally done it. Um, this was a very interesting paper. What they did, this is published in 2005, uh, shortly after the 9-11 Twin Towers collapsed. Um, one of the researchers here, I think it was maybe these guys, went to New York and they took little glass containers. They took, I don't know, a couple dozen glass containers that were clean. And they took these paper napkin type things, like we call them Kim wipes in the lab. And they went building to building and they'd soak the piece of paper with some solvent and they'd wash, like just wipe a window of a building and then put it in a container and label it with the address and everything. And what they actually did is they went um, all over the city and did this, took random samples from windows all over the city and then took them back and um, analyzed them all for the presence of dioxins. And what they actually found is like the site of the Twin Towers, it was like these concentric rings. They had the highest amounts very close to the Twin Towers and the further you went away by distance, those concentrations got lower and lower and lower. And the idea was is that when the trade, uh, when the World Trade Center's towers collapsed and there was a very raging fire going on inside, um, this process produced dioxins by burning PVC plastic. And those, that PVC plastic was hot, it was airborne, um, the, the dioxins were airborne, and they like to settle out on surfaces. And windows, glass windows, are known to be surfaces where nonpolar molecules like to settle. And so the windows will develop this film over time and they were able to like basically get a measure of the dioxin exposure through this way. So it's kind of a neat, um, neat use of technology. Uh, but yeah, they, they specialized, this guy at the, um, at the Institute of Ocean Sciences which is a government lab in BC, uh, specializes in detecting these very, very toxic molecules present in the environment. So that's it, you don't want PVC to burn. And that is a potential health issue since houses contain so much PVC in them. And if a house burns, that could pose direct threats if you are like a first responder, a firefighter or whatever, you don't wanna be breathing in those fumes. It's probably also why people say like you shouldn't burn plastic if you're at a bonfire or something like that. Although PVC is the only one that's gonna make the dioxins because it's the only one that contains any chlorine. But most people don't know one plastic from another and so if you throw it all in together, it's probably still a bad idea. Um, vinyl shower curtains, these are the plasticky ones, you know. Do you ever unfold one of those and set it up right out of the package and you can smell this kind of chemical smell coming off of it for like a couple days? Uh, this is just one study that's talking about 100 toxic chemicals, but concentration? Remember, the fact that they're toxic is a meaningless statement. If you don't know the dose and you don't know how toxic, you don't know the LD50, you don't know the route of exposure, all those things. You can't just say something's toxic, therefore bad. However, I would probably suggest if you do put up one of these shower curtains, it's probably best practice um, to open the windows, make sure you have very good ventilation in there. For the first week or so, you have this thing out because it will off-gas these um, volatile chemicals for the first several days of its life. What do they say, 28 days? Few more questions. What rigid plastic has recycling code number two and is made of tightly packed chains with minimal branching? This was the high density polyethylene. What is added to PVC to make it soft and pliable? Phthalates. Phthalates is a weird word. There's to have PHTH. 
Maybe someone else can give me more examples. I don't know any non-chemistry words that has that combination of letters together. Apparently it's, it's, it's a Greek root because it come, PH is from phi, which I think has this symbol, and TH is theta, which has this symbol. So having those two symbols together in a Greek word gives you the PHTH. But the only words I've ever seen are chemistry words like phthalate. The other one is naphthalene, N-A-P-H-T-H, A-L-E-N-E, has that in there as well. Uh, if you know any other words that have that, I'd be curious to hear them. What is added to PVC and vinyl records to make them more electrically conductive? And this is just carbon in the form of graphite, not diamonds. They don't put diamond in there, but graphite is an allotrope of carbon, and that's the one that, that helps it not build up charge static electricity. All right, moving down the list. We got the first three covered. We have polyethylene, we have polypropylene, we have PVC. The fourth one is PETE, which is a type of polyester. It's polyethyl terra, I, I, mean, I don't even know what it all stands for. It is often used in clothing. It has a pretty complex molecular structure that you see there. Um, around 30 million metric tons were produced in 2017. Around 60% is used to make fabric. So think about like your quick dry workout clothes. If it's not cotton, it's probably this stuff. And this actually is believed to also be a possible important source of microplastics because every time you wash one of these, little threads can come off and then it goes in the water waste stream and ends up, you know, potentially getting it into the environment. Both the other 30% can be used to make drink containers. So, you know, lots of use for this particular substance as well. Uh, your, your classic pop bottle is made out of PETE and has a recycling code one. Um, when you buy, or, or sorry, I should say when it's manufactured, the way they actually make pop bottles is they have these little um, thick walled little things that look almost like a test tube, but with a normal pop bottle top. And what they do is they actually like put this thing into a mold and heat it and pump air in and it actually expands to fit the shape of the mold. And so like these are like a generic bottle piece that like any manufacturer could buy and use the same ones. They're just blown into different shapes for different brands and different types of pops and things like that. Um, I, I find this funny that my kids had when they were little like a chemistry set and what they actually used in the set, what came with the set for test tubes were like these exact little things, which is like a uninflated pop bottle. So I, I don't know where you buy those, but apparently they're a thing that's available. Now the number five plastic that I wanted to talk about is polystyrene, PS. It uses this monomer styrene and again makes these long chains where every second carbon in the chain has a benzene ring on it. We would call these phenyl groups. And this plastic is called polystyrene. Um, if you pump it full of air, we call it styrofoam. We make a foam out of it. And styrofoam, of course, is probably what you're used to in like disposable coffee cups and, and things like that. We make about 15 million metric tons in 2016. It's recyclable, depending on where you live, under recycling code number six. And it's the number five most commonly produced plastic in our world today. So nylon doesn't even crack the top five anymore. One of the main uses for polystyrene is in packing materials, packing peanuts, or just like the package themselves, just bricks of this stuff. If you buy a computer, for example, it's probably gonna be packed in styrofoam um, because it's light, meaning it's cheap to ship. And it's, uh, you know, if, if, if something gets banged around a little bit, it, it offers a lot of protection to what's inside. This is another art piece, it shows 166,000 packing peanuts, which is the number of overnight packages shipped by air in the US every hour. So just like imagine for each of those packages, how much styrofoam there could potentially be inside over the course of days, weeks, months, years. 
It's an incredibly large amount of this plastic. Um, one way around this actually is you can, uh, they, they make little packing peanuts like this now that are made out of starch. I don't know if you ever see these before, but they look the same, but they're made out of starch. And if you put these in water, they just dissolve, um, which is a problem if a package gets wet and then you have all this gross, sloppy stuff in it. Um, so, you know, they're maybe not as good as styrofoam for that reason. But in, in an environmental sense, I mean, realistically, I guess you could probably just throw them outside and they'd blow all around and then <laughs> they, they, they become food. It's like popcorn, really, at that point. Styrofoam really gets a bad rap. And, and the main reason why styrofoam gets a bad rap is because more so than almost any other plastic, it has a super long lifetime in the environment. It doesn't break down really easily at all. All the other ones, they, they last, you know, hundreds of years. The polystyrene, you go back a couple hundred years uh, and dig it up, it looks identical. Like, it, it really is super, super stable to break down in the environment. And so this is why people um, often vilify this one a lot more than anything else. Phenylphthalene is another example of a PHTH, which is also a chemistry word. Um, this is a study that was done at the University of Victoria uh, probably about, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, where what they actually did is they, they looked at a bunch of different containers you might use to drink coffee or a hot drink out of, and they included like a regular ceramic mug, a plastic mug, a glass mug, uh, like a paper cup, which is probably the most common, what you'd see now, versus styrofoam cups. And what they looked at really was not the garbage issue, because they actually claim in the paper that the garbage issue is like a human behavior issue. If we work harder to collect our garbage and deal with it, it's only an issue because of what, the way we behave. But they were saying, that what they were arguing in this paper is that if you looked at the amount of energy required to produce these cups, it turns out that um, foam cups require like basically no energy to produce, and because they're so light, very, very low amounts of energy to ship. But of course you'd say, well, that's easy to say, but you know, a mug you can use over and over and over and over again. And so what they did is the they did the calculation to see how many times you would have to reuse um, a, a, a mug in order for the energy it took to create it to equal the same, you know, number of uses of disposable one-use cups. And what they found was the crossover was like here. So what, it, what that means is um, for foam, you'd have to reuse a mug like, uh, well, that one's paper. Foam is like down here. Before a mug becomes energy saving, for its production, you have to reuse it like 200 times. For it to, so, so basically what that means is to make one ceramic mug costs about the same energy as about 200 styrofoam cups. So you might say, well, yeah, you can use your ceramic mug more than 200 times. But the problem is that that calculation actually assumes that you never wash it. If you take your ceramic mug and use hot water to wash it and soap to wash it, you'll never come close in terms of energy use. So it's actually, from this perspective, more environmentally friendly to use disposable one-use styrofoam cups every time and throw them out. Now that's only from that one environmental perspective, which is energy cost. And we know energy cost is really the reason behind climate change because energy cost comes from burning fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, that's not the only environmental concern we have to worry about. The garbage problem is a real problem, especially when it gets out into the environment. Um, it's been argued though that, you know, if you recycle this properly, not recycle it even, just bury it. Just don't let it get into the environment, just put it, bury it in a hole like we do with the rest of our garbage. This is one of the best substances to landfill because the fact that it doesn't break down means it doesn't leach anything through the soil 
to run off into brown water or get into lakes or streams or anything like that. It's the same as like burying glass or burying rocks or burying stuff like that. It just gets buried and sits there and does nothing until you decide maybe sometime later you want to dig it back up again. So really what I'm trying to say here is I'm not trying to defend the use of single-use plastics, but I, I do want to say too that even an issue like this, which almost everybody would say single-use plastics are bad, we should get rid of them, it's not that simple. There's, there's nuance to that argument. They're good for some things, they're not good for other things. We have to be careful about when we decide something is bad and eliminate it, what we replace it with. Because what we replace it with very well may be worse <laughs> than what we were using before. So, you know, in Nova Scotia, we've gotten rid of shopping bags, the single-use plastic bags. So what are you using now? <laughs> what I do, actually, is I just use the shopping cart, wheel it out to my car, and then just, like, put everything in my car. I don't actually have a bag at all. And uh, it means many trips when I get home, in and out, to get it into my house. And that's clearly using less material. And gives me some more exercise, too, I guess. But, you know, if you use some other type of bag that's, you know, maybe it, I don't know, like imagine using like a leather bag. There's no way, environmentally, the cost of producing that leather bag is going to be less than a million plastic bags, if you know what I mean. So you, you just have to um, recognize that these problems are often not just as simple as good or bad, yes or no, and there's some nuance that can be involved in them. All right, another uh, plastic I want to just briefly mention, uh, it's not on our, our top list or anything like that, it's Teflon, PTFE, which stands for polytetrafluoroethylene. It's the same as the ethylene molecule, but the hydrogens are replaced with fluorines, and it makes this long chain of carbons where each carbon has two fluorines attached. Uh, Teflon is a very interesting chemical, it is extremely chemically inert, meaning it doesn't react with almost anything. It doesn't burn. It, it'll melt, I guess, but um, it doesn't react with acids or bases or really anything. And the other thing about it, which is very unique, is it's extremely non-sticky. So oils won't stick to it. Water won't stick to it. It's, it doesn't stick to polar or non-polar things. And I have a picture here of a gecko that's, I had a picture of a gecko climbing up a wall, and the way these work is, you know, they have um, actually these little structures on their feet with extremely high surface area that allow them to stick to almost any surface. Teflon was the sur first surface that they can't stick to. So if you're living somewhere that has geckos and you don't want them climbing up your walls, I suppose what you could do is take like a band of Teflon and put it all the way around your house. So they'd climb up so far that they'd fall off. They couldn't climb past that part. They can't stick to Teflon. It was accidentally in 19, uh, developed in 1938, which is actually very useful because the fact that this is so inert, unreactive, was actually useful in um, the chemistry that was eventually used to purify uranium, which is used to make the nuclear bombs towards the end of World War II. So this was a timely, for that, uh, for that particular industry, a timely invention. So Teflon is used all the time. Teflon, um, or derivatives of Teflon, are often used in clothing or textiles to make them basically stain-proof. Uh, Scotchgard is one word that's often used for it. Carpets are often Scotchgarded. Uh, clothing can be Scotchgarded too. Basically what it does is it makes your clothing non-stick and it makes your clothing um, resistant to uh, stains and things like that as well. Uh, Gore-Tex is another Teflon-based fabric. And Gore-Tex, you know, is, uh, it's often used for outer wear, like jackets and things like that. And it's described as, you know, it allows water vapor to breathe through it. It's breathable, but it doesn't, but it's waterproof. And that's because water molecules, when they're in the vapor phase, are small enough to fit through little holes but water droplets, which are big collections of water molecules, are too big to let individual water mo molecules through. It's kind of a, a two-way material that way. 
All right, what polymer is used to make styrofoam cups and packing peanuts? That is polystyrene. I don't know how many questions we're up to now. We're, we're doing well though. We must be at least in the 80s or so, I think. I think I, I, I promised you 100. That was the goal at least, pre-strike. We might get there yet. Uh, what's the primary environmental issue associated with polystyrene? It's the first one, it degrades extremely slowly, which creates a persistent litter garbage problem. Do you guys hear, do you, anyone ever go to the, the uh, Kenfield Ravine? It's right next to the Kenfield Research Center. It's got a, like a really nice hiking trail. I go down there a lot in the winter for snowshoeing because it's like in a valley and it's not windy. So if, if it's windy everywhere else, it's like a really nice protected place. But um, it's, it's been ruined just lately. There was a mudslide in there and uh, apparently built right next to it was a garbage dump. And there was a mudslide which basically uh, garbage from the old garbage dump just went, went whoosh and filled the whole valley up. No, well not filled to the top, but there's, there's trash all through there now. So uh, I wonder how much of that is polystyrene, which is, will look just like the day it was when it was first put there. A few interesting things maybe, just to, you know, to end off of, of this chapter, some new technology. There's always new advances taking place in the field of plastics and polymers. Uh, one feature of plastics is that almost all of them are insulators, electric insulators, which means they don't transmit electrical current, and which is great because this is what we use to wrap wires. So wires can be wrapped in plastic and you could like hold the wire while there's a whole bunch of charge going through it and it's not going to obviously lead to, to any issues. Um, however, there has been some recent research and by recent, I would say the last 25, 30 years, this has really taken off, is the development of polymers or plastics that can conduct electricity. The first one ever discovered was in 1976, which is like 45 years ago. Um, and they found that this particular plastic, which is called polyacetylene, if you react it with iodine vapor, will conduct electricity just as well as copper. And the problem with copper is it's expensive, it's heavy, it's dense, uh, it, it's hard to process because if you want to make, make it a certain shape, you got to melt it, which requires very high temperatures. Um, Polymers are, 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 plastics are cheap, they're easy to make, they're easy to customize, they're easy to make any shape you want. Um, the idea was, is, well, could we replace wires with plastics? You could make machinery much less bulky, you know, there's all these advantages people were envisioning. And there's been a lot of development in this area. So they won the Nobel Prize in the, the year 2000 for the discovery and development of conductive polymers. And this is a, like a whole huge field now. So one of the things that has come out of this field that is now a commercial product are what are called OLEDs, which are organic light emitting diodes. And the way organic light emitting diodes work is they have a layer that is like a conductive but transparent layer. It's usually a material called indium tin oxide. And then they have like a plastic layer in between which is conductive. And then they have like a metal, and it could be, I don't know, some metal like aluminum or something like that on the other side. And what they can do is put a current across there and the conductive polymer actually, while it's conducting electrons, can give off light. And they use this to make these displays, uh, which are called organic light emitting diodes. And they use them for TVs. All of the Apple iPhones, I think since the 13 Pro are use this OLED technology and they don't use the old liquid crystals or what they used to use before that time. The advantage of the OLEDs is that when you turn off a pixel, it's off and it looks black, like perfectly black because there's no light coming from it. Where the old system, the liquid crystal displays, the way they worked is they had a light but then they had like each pixel was almost like shutters that were either like closed or open. 
But even when they're closed, some light would leak through. The backlight was always on. And uh, like if you buy a TV and it's, it's, it's an LED TV, this is what you got. You got liquid crystal. The LED is what the light is in the back. The light always is on. And what that means is even when the pixel is off, you get light leaking through. The OLEDs, when it's off, it's off, and it's black. So that gives you a nicer picture. It gives you better contrast. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see this is advertising. If you look at iPhone and you look at the different screen types, it's like, you know, 20,000 to one contrast ratios and this kind of stuff. And it's based off, off of that. They say like perfect black, intense color. But the big reason why like Apple wants them in the phones is they use a lot less energy because the light's not always on. And energy use is probably most important in applications like phones where you want your battery to live as long as possible. So these screens, probably the biggest advantage for an end user is it means you have a longer battery life as a result of having this type of screen. This is all a result of like modern developments in conducting plastics. All right, I don't need to talk about that anymore. Uh, another very interesting development is work that's being done on producing bioplastics, which means making plastic single use perhaps, containers, out of plastics that are made out of biomolecules, often starch. And cornstarch is often used where you take, grow corn, it's, the starch is removed and turned into these little pellets, and these can be used to make things like plastic wrap or plastic plates or containers or things like that. The nice thing about this, first of all, is it's not, it's, it's based on a renewable resource. And second of all, the ultimate plastic in the end is, is very biodegradable. So these are, are used. This is actually a picture from um, a couple of years ago. You know the little kiosk that is upstairs here that, where you can get coffee? They were selling a bunch of these products, like you could buy these containers. I'm not sure what that particular container would be good for, but I don't know, flowers or something. But it's made out of this corn plastic. And you could see too, like buying a salad or something like that, it might come in one of these types of containers. Uh, these are made out of this corn plastic, sometimes called PSM, for plast starch material. And these potentially get around this issue of the persistent garbage problem. You know, these sorts of things, I, I mean, I guess if you ended up throwing it in the ocean, would either degrade rapidly on its own, or who knows, maybe even organ, like plant, like animals could eat them and get energy from them if it's just starch processed in a certain way. Bioplastics though, you know, like everything, there's good and bad, and there's pros and cons, and everything has this issue. Um, the use of bioplastics has their own issues. It might solve the garbage problem, but it creates other ones. One of them, it only reduces fossil fuel use by about 20 to 40%. That's because you still have to use a lot of energy to process them and make them. You also have to use energy to farm the corn, till the fields, you know, all those sorts of things. So they do reduce fossil fuel use, but they certainly don't eliminate it. Uh, when they decompose, they produce CO2, which I guess you could say you want them to decompose, but there may be a, something to be said for things like polystyrene that just lock the carbon underground as carbon and never change. We don't want it up in the atmosphere either, right? Where, where's a better place to keep it? Uh, you need to grow the corn, which means either you're clearing forest and growing more corn, or you're div diverting corn that we're already using for food or animal feed. I guess you could say if we eliminated meat and took all the corn that we feed cows and use it to make plastic, that would be a, probably a net improvement. But um, the way we do it now, what happens is if we start diverting corn to produce um, plastics, that's gonna drive up food prices because corn is definitely a staple. And people will stop growing corn for food and use it for this purpose instead. This has already been seen, by the way, in the US where people are growing corn, not large scale for making plastic, but for making ethanol. And ethanol is a, is a fuel additive that's 
up to 10% of the gas that you fill your car with is ethanol. So it's, it's you know, a good environmental thing. It's like a, it's a, a fuel additive that um, has many environmental benefits, but it does, has led to a big increase in the like commodity value of corn, which makes it expensive to buy. Which, you know, I guess if you're going to like the grocery store to buy a pack of corn, it may, you may not even notice if it's 10 cents more or, or whatever. But there's a lot of places, particularly poor countries, that imports of corn are a very important source of nutrition. And these are just political issues that, and economic issues that have to be considered when you make decisions about how we use our land, how we then use the crops we grow on the land, et cetera. All right, more questions. This one's a bit of a trick, because we didn't talk about this one really. What polymer below do you expect to be most soluble in water, most water soluble? And you might look at this, how am I supposed to know that? First of all, we never talked about polyacrylonitrile on the right, a few there, but we never talked about water solubility. This is where you have to use your chemical intuition. If you go back to our water chapter, we talked in detail about what dissolves well in water and what doesn't, and we said, Compounds that have OH groups can hydrogen bond. Water has OH groups, can hydrogen bond. If a molecule has lots of OH groups, it's probably gonna be water soluble. And we looked at the example of sucrose. Well, polyvinyl alcohol has on every second carbon OH groups, and this makes it very water soluble. So the answer is PVA because of all the OH groups which you could answer without even knowing what PVA is. You can tell based on its chemical structure. And this is one of the things we do as chemists. You can look at a molecule's chemical structure and make predictions about how it's going to behave without even making it, without even knowing what it could be. So you could hypothetically, if you understood what structural features on a polymer led to what properties in terms of how stiff it is or whatever, you could design plastics with features that you wanted them to have. Polyvinyl alcohol, by the way, is found in glue. If you buy like, you know, the, the non-toxic children's school glue, uh, it's often clear or sometimes it's white. That's polyvinyl alcohol dissolved in water. And when it dries, that film you get of glue, if you ever, when you're a kid, put it on your hand and you peel it off, that's the solid polyvinyl alcohol that would easily redissolve again back in water. That's it. It's 2.14. We have no time to start a new unit, so we're going to close things off six minutes early. And Thursday, we're going to start our next unit, which is pesticides. Awesome. So we'll see everybody in a couple days. Oh, I just wanted to say, too, about the second assignment, which is the due date. Is that Thursday? 7th, I think. Um, I'm starting to get a lot of emails from people saying, like, can I do this by myself? And the answer is absolutely yes. If you want to do it on your own, that's totally fine. Uh, if you have any issues that require my attention, please let me know. And uh, my ability to help if you need like chemicals or gear or stuff like that is pretty limited. But if you need any other pointers, just please get in touch with me. Awesome.